Expedition 44, here again with Matt and Ryan. We have a special guest today. We've been in the middle of a long series on the church, and I am super excited about our guest because I would say in my life, he's been perhaps more influential than possibly anybody else in the church. Matt, who do we got? Hey, we've got Frank Viola. So um, a little bit about him. He is a conference speaker, blogger, best-selling author. Um, he helps serious followers of Jesus know their Lord more deeply so that they can experience real transformation and make long-lasting impact. So Frank's blog is frankviola.org. Um, it's regularly ranked in the top five of all Christian blogs on the web, and his podcast, Christ is All, is ranked number one in Canada, number two in the USA on iTunes. His Insurgents podcast features discussions with his conversation partners on the explosive gospel of the kingdom. I uh, love that book also. I've got that right here. Signed copy from Frank. Um, so yeah, Frank, it's awesome to have you here on Expedition 44. We're really excited about this conversation. My privilege. I'm looking forward to it. I first... Uh became aware of Frank and his works a long time ago. It was about 2009, and I had uh, co-planted a church a few years before that. It was a very organic style of church, only about uh, 200 people. We met in a movie theater that we revamped to be a church, and uh, right away we we both decided that we wanted this church to kind of be the unchurch, which I, I think a lot of churches start out saying that, but we weren't really quite sure what that meant or where we were going. And so we were reading a lot of different books out there. Uh, both of us were into theology. So uh, most of them were theology books, but the guy that I co-planted the church with uh Red pegging Christianity, and I think it just rocked his world. Uh, he finished it in two days, and he gave me the book and said, Ryan, you got to read this. And I read it probably in a day, and we sat down and we formulated how we were going to completely revamp church. And that led to over the next uh, three to six months, getting all of our leadership to also read the book and then talking about the how how we might go forward from there. Eventually, we followed it up uh, with our whole staff reading Reimagining Church. And I can't tell you how much it uh, just completely changed the culture of our little church. And uh, to this day, I've been a part of about four churches. All of them I have great things to say about. But that one for about four years, beginning with this launch into pagan Christianity and Reimagining Church, was literally the best church I've ever been a part of and can even imagine. It was just incredibly organic, multi-gifted, um, very different than any other church I've ever been. So first, Frank, I wanted to say thank you for those early works and how that has not only impacted the churches I've been involved with, but also now at Covenant Theological Seminary, where I teach and lead the uh, the biblical studies and theology department, most of our core classes have been greatly influenced by not only those two works of yours, but several. Huh. That was pretty amazing. Well, I'm glad to hear it all. Uh, it, hearing that you you read a book in one day, uh, particularly that title that I wrote with George Barna back in 2008, uh, and, and your friend reading it in two days is kind of uncanny to me because it took 10 years to write. <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah so, so yeah Matt, tell me tell us a little bit about your experience with frank well i think we'll get into it maybe a little more as we go through it i've been um part of frank's uh ministry mastermind group called the insurgents experience for the last year it's about 10, 11 of us brothers with, uh, with Frank and, um, he's just been pouring into us and in our ministry. And, um, I've got nothing but amazing things to say about that and the transformation that's come from, um, working with Frank for the, the last year and having him mentor and pour into, to my life. And so that's kind of where I've, um, 
found about a, him. Um, it's really through his book Insurgents is where I read that and it completely changed my perspective of the gospel, and my perspective of the kingdom. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, me bragging on you, Frank, and uh, I'm just so appreciative of you. And uh, this new book that you have, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, is another incredible um, book that is going to impact the church. Mm. I don't know what to say to that, man. I guess my my first thought is the suction in this room is so great the walls are caving in, <laughs> but that wouldn't be very nice. No, I no. appreciate it. The no. the uh, the comments are genuine, and it's uh, it's humbling really to hear <laughs> when you are you know doing the Lord's work, whether it's writing or speaking, or you're working with a group of leaders, and they say things like "My life was transformed," etc. It's it's pretty hard to it's pretty hard to get my head around, um, you know, because it's, I don't know, it's a humbling thing. But then again, you know, the things that I share change my own life. So I guess in that way, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So this book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, um, is, uh, Ryan and I both read it, um, part of your launch team and that uh, had a little sneak preview. There's Ryan's a got book it there in on front the of us. Yep. There's also on, on uh, Frank's frank's icon there in front you can see that i also read it in a day i was uh wow i i just thought it was a great read i i started in the morning uh at about 4 a.m and i think i was done before lunch and uh i thought it was just a you know phenomenal read i also did that with jesus manifesto i um really the thing i appreciate it the most is as i'm reading it i think in every chapter there was a point where i went Oh, that's me, you know, and, wow. and, it, and, and I did that in a way that uh, was very humbling, but it didn't come up. I didn't put the book down. You know what I mean? Like it, mm. it wasn't, uh, it wasn't written in a way that, that just kept throwing rocks or stones at me. You know, I, I could gracefully accept that. Yeah, I did that. I need to, I need to change that aspect and continue going. And I really appreciated that matter. In fact, I, I felt I've read, I believe all of your works and I felt like it was probably my favorite in terms of writing style of any, any of them so far. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, Frank, about the origin of the book, why you decided to write it and how did you come up with 48 laws? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting way to put it because I didn't come up with a number. Uh, you know, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine gave me a, a an external hard drive that had a bunch of audiobooks on it. I was new to audiobooks. And I managed to uh, extract some of the books uh, to a uh, flash disk, which at the time, you know, I could put it in my car and listen to it. And I was on a long drive. And I started to listen to some of these audio books and I came across a book called 48 Laws of Power. Never heard of the book, never heard of the author, but I listened to about four or five chapters in it. And what the book is, uh, it, it is a study on how to leverage the fleshly nature of the human being in order to gain power and influence over other people, whether in work or in relationships or career, et cetera. And what he does, what the author does, is he lays out these 48 principles that he calls laws on how to gain earthly worldly power, okay? And it, it's just a study in the flesh is what it is, <laughs> but <laughs> it triggered it triggered an idea. And that was, wait a minute, what if we had a book on the laws of God's power, which operate completely opposite and antithetical to the laws of, you know, worldly natural power. Um, so that's that's the germ of the idea. And as I begin to think through it over the years, again, this is about 10 years ago, um, I began to, you know, uh, make an outline and, and I came up with 48 as well. <laughs> uh, and I thought that was a good analog, you know, to that book. Now, since very recently, in fact, last week, I, I was curious as to how many books 
the original 48 laws sold. That book, gentlemen, has sold over 1.2 million copies. It's extremely popular. And the majority audience are prison inmates and celebrities. Wow. Which I think would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I thought, you know, excuse me, I thought if if 48 laws of spiritual power could sell even a fraction of that, perhaps we'd see a revolution in the body of Christ because it is sod turning. <clears throat> it is sod turning in some ways. So yeah, that basically was the origin of the book. And, you know, um, brothers, I write the book that I want to read, but I can't find because it doesn't exist. And so I looked for a book like this and it did not exist. So then I took on the project, the Himalayan project of, of writing it myself. Now, there are lots of books about God's supernatural, miraculous power, um, you know, mostly written to charismatic audiences. But this is something very different. This covers God's power in all aspects of ministry, not just the miraculous. So, Frank, define what where we're going with power. You've you've mentioned spiritual power worldly power and kind of differentiated between a uh charismatic definition of power can you kind of elaborate on these definitions a little bit yeah so when i say spiritual power i'm talking about the dynamic energy of the holy spirit and what the power of god does is it alters situations uh, to heal, to deliver, to awaken, to convert, to uh, enlighten, and to transform human beings. Uh, another word for the power of God is the anointing of God or the anointing of the Spirit. And and by the way, that is not a charismatic term. You find it, <laughs> you find it in both Old and New Testaments. Yeah. Um, but God's power on a human vessel to carry out God's will. Uh, in either life or ministry is is the dynamic energy of the Holy Spirit or the anointing of God. And and I believe, and this is not only borne out from Scripture, because you can find it all over the New Testament, but it's borne out in my own experience that the key to effective ministry, to bearing fruit, uh, is the power of God. If you're not serving in God's power, if I'm not serving in God's power, what are we drawing on? Well, we're drawing on the energy of the flesh. Mm -hmm. That that uh, which we are by birth, physical birth, is flesh. Uh, it doesn't have to be evil. It's just natural. And, you know, that's fine for, you know, digging a hole. <laughs> it's fine for, you know, building a ship. But ministry requires the power of God in order for there be there to be everlasting fruit, uh, eternal value, and real true transformation. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so we've been going through a series on the church, and especially we're looking at church leadership right now, and kind of the a lot of the positional view of authority and power, um, really comes from the world. And you talk about that a lot in your book. So what do you see are maybe some common traps in ministry today that um, ministers fall into? And how can they avoid them? <clears throat> well, there's there's a lot. And, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm exhibit A for some of this, uh, particularly people pleasing is huge. And it's endemic to anyone who's in ministry is the impulse to please people. And I have a whole chapter. It's one of the laws. <laughs> Don't be a people pleaser. And, and what I do in that chapter is it's not just, you know, a statement uh, that conveys the idea this is not good. It digs deeper into why people are trying to please people in the first place. You know, what, what are the roots of people pleasing? And so I give a um, an exploration on that as well as a, a prescription on how to overcome it. And at the end of the day, you can't please God and man. You cannot please the Lord and please humans. 
uh, those two are going to conflict at some point, oftentimes many points. So that would be one of the traps. Uh, another trap that I see very often, and I think if you've been a Christian for any length of time, <clears throat> you've been around leaders, um, this is a big one. And it's something that's easy to fall into if God is using you. Uh, but that's pride and arrogance. Yeah, and, I was reading that, that. This is the first thing in your <laughs> book that like just set me off. It's it's never hurt God's people. The first the first law, law one, and I'll I'll quote a paragraph in here. It says it disheartens me to write this next sentence. But Christian leaders who have been sufficiently broken to respond gently when criticized, who react with grace when corrected, who feel no jealousy towards others whom God has gifted, who don't feel threatened by those who have God's favor, and who refuse to return evil for evil are rarer than diamonds. Out of all the pastors I know, Matt's the only one who fits that bill. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> Put him on the pedestal right no. there. But it's unfortunate that you are absolutely right. The the pride and arrogance are, are just you know, men, and, and I, you know, I'm not a woman, so I can't really speak for women, but boy, men in ministry, this just seems to get them every single time. Well, it, it is true that the more successful your ministry is, success uh, as the world has it, or as you may uh, deem it, the more ripe and open a person is to pride and arrogance. And at the end of the day, it's confusing the paintbrush with the great artist who uses the paintbrush and losing touch with the fact that we're all marred, imperfect, flawed paintbrushes, but God in his mercy will use, he always uses flawed people, right? I mean, we're mm -hmm. all flawed. Yeah. Um, but when someone sees either God using them or because of their own talents and gifting, they are building something that's successful in the eyes of the world. It can go to a person's head. They lose sight of the fact that they're an imperfect paintbrush. They lose sight of the fact that God is the one who's, you know, doing it through them. And, and there's a, there's this sense of almost self-righteousness and it's, it is plagued many, many leaders, especially those who have larger congregations or larger ministries, or if they're a social media person, larger followings, more fans, etc. But it's a huge trap. And, and so I do address it in a few of the chapters in the book for sure. And by the way, I agree with your sentiment about Matt, your kind <laughs> words about Matt. I have been with Matt in the evening and he does glow in the dark if there's no yeah, light. Right. <laughs> Well, thanks, Frank. Appreciate oh, you're that. Welcome. You're welcome, bro. <laughs> high five. Well, high five. High five. Computer. High five. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are what are some other marks or characteristics of maybe pride or arrogance in somebody who is in ministry? You've listed a few. Are there any other <sighs> like red flags you should look out for? Yeah. Well, th this is these would be the symptoms of uh, pride and arrogance in uh, a person who is in ministry. Um, and these are these are often ignored um, by the person who is, you know, hosting the pride and arrogance in their hearts. Uh, sometimes, well, I would say very often a leader who is inflicted with this is not in touch with it. But it's also true for those looking on. They don't really see this or they don't recognize it. OK, so I'll give you a list. One of them is they're inaccessible. You can't reach them. And that's when somebody puts themselves in the position of a celebrity. You know, um, you and I can't reach Johnny Depp, even though he's on social media. He's a celebrity. You and I can't reach Taylor Swift. She's a celebrity. Well, when a pastor or a kingdom leader uh, is inaccessible <clears throat> right there, it shows you that there's a problem. Yeah. Now, I realize that that, you know, the larger your church and congregation, the more mail you're going to get. I get it. I get a lot of it mail, but you could always have somebody help you. Right. And and here's the problem. A person who's inflicted with pride and arrogance is not only inaccessible. 
to you know their congregation or if they're an author, the people who read their books, it goes beyond that. They're even inaccessible to their peers. And they will only allow a small handful of people to have access to them. That, that's a clear sign of pride and arrogance. Another one is they refuse to co-work with other leaders. They want to be, <clears throat> excuse me, they want to be solo acts, right? They want to be Michael Jackson's instead of <laughs> members of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, they will not co-work. Um, and part of that is because, A, they want to have all the control. You lose that um, complete independence when you work as a team. But the other one is the fear of being outshined. Mm. You know, they don't want to be... <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to be the recipient of uh, you know, someone else taking the spotlight or sharing. It. So those are just some of the ones that come up. But yeah, it is. It's a real problem. And as we know, and we'll probably talk about this later, but pride and arrogance always have has a consequence. It's a slow ticking bomb that sooner or later, and usually it's later, will go off. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So Frank, there's a there's a question that kind of comes as I read this whole work, and that's if I am a minister at the church and I'm trying to shepherd and care for others, um, most people realize it's it's the ones that are doing that if they're if they're truly servants that are getting beat up. What how how do you how do you help somebody take care of themselves? while they're taking care of serving, shepherding others? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's several parts of the book, as you know, that address that. Um, you know, I have a whole piece on burnout yep. and rust out and fade out, <laughs> uh, which all spring from, from this particular issue. Um, well, first... I, I love the one on discouragement, too, that hits on this. Oh, well. well, that's that hits close to home for me. So yeah. when we get to that, we'll, we'll talk about it. But, you know, one of the things that must be understood first are the roots of why people very often will fail to take care of themselves at the expense of caring for other people. Um, one of them is, is this issue of people pleasing that we talked about that will always lead to burnout eventually. It's so crushing to find a, 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 a person who's uh, you know, a a consistent people pleaser to see themselves crushed under the weight. And very often people pleasers, uh, they don't realize it, but the people they're pleasing will eventually become displeased with them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that That grace only goes so far. And once you do something that is offensive in their eyes, they will turn... <laughs> just like the people in Lystra turned from worshiping Paul and Barnabas to stoning them. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, but that's, that's one. The other one is, uh, you know, drawing on natural power, the, the energy of the flesh rather than God's power, because that will, that will burn out very fast. You know, God's power is unlimited in it, in the energy it provides Human power uh, is is very limited, and the other one is religious ambition is often involved when you know people are expending, expending, and expending energy. I'm talking about leaders now, and and then they burn out because they're not taking care of their own soul. It's religious ambition. They want to climb that ladder, okay? You know, they want to they want to move into that elevated spot, and so they're just burning both ends of the candle. But, you know, it's the principle of the oxygen mask is perfect here. Yeah. You know, uh, you get on a plane, what's the first thing you hear? Hey, if we're in a crisis, if the plane goes down, put your oxygen ma mask on first before you, you know, help someone else. And at the end of the day, a leader is not going to be able to help anybody if they themselves are not caring for their own soul and spirit, and that does require intentionality and it requires dealing with some of these things that I've talked about, which are at the root very often of, of, of minute of people burning out in ministry. Yeah, that's good. Um, so 
throughout this book, you give a whole lot of different laws that could potentially be neglected. Can you give us one that you see as maybe most <laughs> often neglected um, in, in this book? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you more than one. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> because fine. because I, I, I sort of feel like this when when it comes to writing a book. Um, I feel like if a book is already out there addressing issues, mm -hmm. why add another one to the to the pile? You know what I mean? It's it, it's not worth just repeating what other people have said. Um, so so I feel like unless I'm going to deal with something that's been neglected and shine a light on it or take a subject that has been talked about it and put it in a, an entirely different paradigm or you know shed fresh light on it or reframe it in a fresh way that's not worth writing so i feel like in a way <clears throat> most all of these laws have been neglected it just depends on the person yeah. who is reading the book at the time because you know for for you you may say, well, law seven and law nine, law 10, law 10 uh, are, have been neglected in my own life, or Ryan may say law five, law six, law, law 18 have been neglected in my life. And then I may say they're all neglected, and that's why I'm writing about it. But uh, anyway, that was a joke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think we all neglect certain things at certain times. And part of that is we need to be reminded. But the other part of it is we have to look at it in a different way. And one of the principles I've learned in spiritual life and in ministry is once you see, you can't unsee. Okay. Once you see something in a new way and the Lord opens your eyes to it, you can never unsee it. It just doesn't happen. So that's one of the experiences I want people to have as they read this. Um, all right. So here are some neglected ones. Uh, law number four, it takes one to make one. And basically, uh, to summarize that, you cannot pass on to other people in, in a way that transforms them that which you have not experienced yourself and that which has not transformed you. So <clears throat> this basically eliminates probably 95% of preaching and teaching and <laughs> sharing <Yeah. laughs> uh, because most of it is just moving from notebook to notebook. Or, you know, it goes from the YouTube video that the pastor who's preparing his sermon Saturday night saw, and now he's going to repeat it Sunday morning because he has nothing. Um, but basically, you're not going to be able to change a person's life for the long haul now. Maybe you can do it in, in a short time span, and they may be okay for a while. But eventually, you're going to see that that, that transformation did not hold okay mm -hmm. and that's because you were never transformed in that area so it takes one to make one if you want people to um, change their behavior in a certain way it, it has to start with you and this goes beyond what you preach you could preach perfect messages you can give wonderful expositions of scripture that are just perfect but unless it's changed you brother sister it's not going to change anybody else in the long haul. So that's one. Um, another one is leave the results with God. I see many leaders obsess over results. You know, uh, how many people were changed? Am I really impacting people? You know, how come nobody's liking this or sharing it on social media? <laughs> what, what, what about the results? They're, they're just caught up in the results. So that's a whole chapter on that one. <clears throat> and then another one, I would say, gosh, there's so many. But the ones that come to mind is uh, law number three, beware the empty house. And this is, a, this is a lesson for all leaders, anyone who's in ministry of any kind. The most vulnerable to temptation that you will ever be is right after God has used you in power. You are open season to temptation because the house has become empty. You have expended God's power, his anointing, and something has to fill it because if it doesn't, you're going to fill it with the wrong things. And so the whole chapter is about that. And I, I remember I was talking to a seminary professor uh, 
let's see, it was I think it was in it was either last year. You gotta or... watch out for those guys, Frank. <laughs> well, he's a friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> I do have friends. Some of the best friends are seminary professors, but anyway, <laughs> no, I I I I love a lot of them and um because I've gotten to know them, but this particular one. <laughs> We were having a conversation. I was telling them uh, about some of the neglected things in the ministry, and and I was saying there's so much uh, that leaders um, are saying. I never learned this in seminary, and I was talking about you know my time with working with pastors and teachers. These were their own confessions after we had have after we have had some conversations, and he said to me, "Well, like what?" And I said, well, the danger of the empty house. And he got mad. He's like, what the heck are you talking about? What does that even mean? And I said, well, you do know about the parable that Jesus gave about the empty house. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it has application for people in ministry. Big application. He had no clue as to what I was talking about. And so my, my point in saying that is this is not only le- neglected, but I think it's largely unknown. Mm-hmm. And when I when people have read that chapter, um, you know, the book has only been out for a short time. I have gotten lots and lots of confirmation from leaders who said nobody ever told me this. This makes a lot of sense. Actually, I've experienced it before. You know, thanks for putting it in print. So it, it's things like that that, you know justify at least in my own mind that this book really needed to be written and a lot of this has been neglected yeah i totally agree frank with the that last one the empty house one for sure i mean i've i've experienced it also but some of the things that at least i know that ryan's trying to do at um at covenant is address these type of things with with our leaders and a lot of that is even stuff we've learned from your books Mm, wow yep so the next thing that I want to kind of hit on, you you get to this a lot in the book, and I really, this really resounded with me well. One of our themes on our YouTube channel, Expedition 44, is backward kingdom. We're constantly looking at how as Christians we are supposed to be countercultural, backwards, different than, than what the world says. And so what the world might say successful could be completely different. And there's a theological uh, idea called a contronym where words kind of mean uh, expressions of things one way and the other. They mean, they mean an example of something greatly one way and an example of something greatly the other. And they're all through the Bible, particularly the Hebrew parts of it. But you hit on this in several chapters. And again, like first chapter, you, you went right to this. You tell a story of somebody that was at a conference and afterwards they, you know, went to talk to their pastor and they were just, you know, completely eviscerated by, by the pastor's words back to them. And, and your reaction to that is, is, and I'll quote you on this, this all proved one thing. Although this man could speak well, talking about the pastor, in front of the audience, he knew nothing of the cross of Jesus Christ. He knew nothing of brokenness. He knew nothing of losing. He reacted purely out of flesh. And I think so often one of the problems with these, you know, today's uber successful Christian CEO mentality is that pride and arrogance, as you said, take them over. But but that wasn't really the root. The root is that they've never experienced, you know, what it means to really be broken in Jesus. And you bring that out over and over and over. And Matt and I really resound there with the back, uh, backward kingdom mindset. Can you share a little bit about it, kind of draw some of the connections of the book together? Well, brokenness is probably the main uh, ingredient that God uses in a person's life to bring them to the place where they have a ministry that has eternal value. You know, there are ministries that 
you know, can be viewed as valuable in the eyes of someone who's using the standard of standards of the world, you know, uh, church attendance, uh, how big is your budget? Um, you know, how big is the building, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, which are the, which are the typical earmarks for success in the Christian world, but eternal values is something different. Uh, that which is going to pass through this veil and go into eternity, what's going to last when the fire falls, what's going to stand, you know, to use, uh, the metaphor that Paul of Tarsus used in first Corinthians three, every man's work is going to be tried. Mm -hmm. And so, if a person is not broken and they're in the Lord's work, they are a dangerous human being. Uh, and the reason why God will bring, <clears throat> whether whatever your theology is, whether you think he brings it or he allows it, okay? <laughs> we, we'll agree on one of those. Whether God brings it or he allows it, uh, trial, tribulation, suffering, pain, heartache, all of these things are designed not to embitter us. That's the danger, is to become offended and embittered, but to break us. And brokenness is an essential qualification to be used in the house of God. Uh, just like Paul says, it is required of all servants to be faithful. Well, I, I will also say, and I'll use Paul's words in other places, using different terminology, it is required of a servant of God to be broken. And the more broken a person is, the more God is going to use them, and it's going to be God and not them. You know, it is through death in us that life works in you. I'm quoting Paul in 2 Corinthians. And so there's a whole lot that's wrapped up in this. And part of the brokenness, believe it or not, comes from failure. And in this in this upside down kingdom which you're talking about failure is actually healthy failure in ministry because it produces some invaluable lessons like humility and god reliance which is the opposite of self-reliance yeah uh self-reliance is poison in the work of god god reliance is something totally different so i have a very different view on failure uh than than most people have and, and by failure i'm not i'm not talking i mean there's some failures that are so big you get thrown out of the race i'm not talking about that paul of tarsus went to athens he had some hopes that he was gonna you know break ground there and raise up a kingdom community but that didn't happen uh he failed in athens you know in terms of what he was wanting to do he only had a handful of converts he was mocked off the stage, so to speak, and there was no uh, believing community, no kingdom community, no ecclesia in Athens. And when he went to Corinth right afterwards, he was in fear and trembling. It broke him. And uh, and he was able to do some amazing things in Corinth as a result. Wow. This is very different than the uh, message that we typically get with, you know, the churches of today. And I'm not just talking mega churches, but even the smaller churches, you kind of have a success at all cost culture, you might say, where, you know, nobody wants to be real or transparent. We have a mutual friend that's been on the show and he's just really, really raw to the point where he like feel uncomfortable sitting in the chair but like on the other hand there's there's something with a pastor doing that that's just amazing that we don't see him un enough in kind of this culture yeah yeah absolutely yeah I'll double click on that <laughs> yeah so you have a chapter on um and we talked about this a little bit already in the episode is about celebrity and ministry and um so ryan did mention mega church and i know you've talked quite a bit about church structure and stuff in some of your books so i don't know if you um are willing to maybe share some of your thoughts on that right now and maybe stuff you've experienced and i don't know maybe a better way okay well i have to be careful here because i do have uh friends who are mega church pastors and you know they're they're serving the lord um they're reaching people uh there's there's one in particular who I regard as a friend. I just heard from him the other day. He is the pastor or was the pastor of one of the largest mega churches, just retired recently. 
Um, and and so, you know, he managed to uh, survive it. Now, I'm going to put it that way because it'll make sense after I say what I'm going to say. Many, many, many megachurch pastors have not survived mm -hmm. that experience. And, you know, if we sat here and just did some searches online, gosh, just this year, 2022, uh, and add 2021, uh, at least five really, really well-known megachurch pastors crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's sad. Um, I have a very, very good friend who uh, brought me in some years ago to meet with a megachurch pastor, uh, got to know him, became friends with him, his team. I'm still good friends with his team to this day, but he crashed and burned earlier this year. And I've had conversations with people who are on the on the inside, you know, inner circle um, co-workers with some of the mega church pastors. And so a lot of my insights have come from conversations with them mixed with observation. And so I'll share a few of them with you. The first one is <clears throat> no human being is wired to handle the kind of power and influence that comes from a typical mega church. We're just not wired for it. And when you give that kind of power and influence to somebody, <laughs> a human being, a mere mortal, I don't care if they're Christian or not, uh, it's going to destroy them at some level with very few exceptions, okay? Um, I, I, I put it this way once when I was talking to uh, one of these people. I said the megachurch structure is designed to destroy the person at the top. <laughs> And it's because, yeah. it, but it's a slow path to destruction because it breeds a sense of entitlement. And what ends up happening is guys who, you know, were denying themselves, following the Lord with, with a great zeal, very slowly and subtly, uh, subtly begin to adopt this sense of entitlement. And they begin to live like celebrities. They have servants who, you know, wait on them hand and foot. Yeah. Um, they they spend obscene amounts of money on material things, whether it's homes, cars, furniture. There's this sense of entitlement. And it's a high honor culture uh, that is developed in this kind of environment that breeds it's actually the breeding ground for codependency yeah. and so all of the all of the people on the team who are around the mega church pastor become codependent and they don't even realize it until and this typically happens the do, the dominoes start falling and uh you know you have a crash and a burn and then the people who are around that person uh, they they end up realizing, looking back now, because they didn't realize it when it was taking place, looking back now that they were codependent and and some of them have to get counseling you know, to get to get some help. So I, I am I'm not condemning anybody here. I'm not condemning megachurch pastors. I'm not I'm not saying that God can't use the system. He uses megachurches all the time i'm saying that that system is unnatural and and then that, that structure uh is basically destructive to the person who's at the top of it i mean it's a machine and what ends up happening is you you have to feed the machine for it to keep going and by yeah. the way those are words taken right out of the right hand man of one of the most well-known megachurch pastors in the country um, you have to keep building the machine. And one of the things that he said to me, and this has been repeated by many who are on the inside, is that basically we were there in the beginning to build people. But eventually, instead of building people, we used people to build the structure. Yeah. Um, right. Have you have you read, uh, what was it, Scott McKnight's uh, Church Called Tove? No, I have not. No, we, we had him on the podcast and he calls it institutional creep that um, slowly the institution 
creeps in front of the people. Yeah. And well, yeah, it's a, it's a slow process for sure. Yeah, it's a slow process. Yeah. And so he, he identifies a lot of that. And we, we had a long conversation with him about Bill Hybels and some of the other people that have fallen. So do you have anything else that you want to comment about that? I mean, we've seen so much of mega church, like failings, uh, over. We like- actually did a series on, uh, Ravi Zacharias, when that happened on, you know, the scandalous thing, but boy, you just go through it and you count all the, all the pastors, Brian Houston resigning, Carl Lentz with both of them with Hillsong. I mean, there's just, and and this has been going on for a long time. I remember the Jim Baker stuff, you know, Uh, how is, how is that related? What are your thoughts on it? Okay. Well, let me, let me just say this here. Um, You know, the we're talking about mega church pastors and very often when there is a quote unquote fall right um when they crash and burn uh sometimes it's relational right it's inappropriate relationships but often it's financial and but it but in in effect it becomes headline news whatever it is mm-hmm. and and they have the result is that they are forced out of their position Sometimes some of these guys turn away from God altogether. And, and there's a really interesting question that, that lies at the, the bottom of this. Um, I remember watching an interview with Johnny Depp, and he was saying that one of the things he learned is that money does not corrupt people. Money reveals corruption that's already there. Hmm. And I don't know if this kind of power that is given to leaders in very, very large congregations. I don't know if it um, corrupts them where they weren't corrupt before, or if it just exposes a corruption or seeds of corruption that were already there. I don't know the answer to that, Uh, but either way, no human being, I'll say it again, is designed for that kind of power. And on to your question about, leaders who who fall in some way whether it's relational or it's uh you know financial or it's it's abusiveness or whatever i only have three things to say one the boomerang effect two the housetop expose and three the danger of the empty house and i'll i'll expand each one the boomerang effect Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And Paul made the statement in 1 Corinthians 10, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Hmm. In Romans 14, 4, he said, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. Now, if you were living in the 1980s, you got a front row seat to the boomerang effect. I don't know if you brothers are aware of this, but during the 1980s, a televangelist fell, and you actually mentioned his name. (laughs) Um, He fell relationally and financially, and it was all over the news and the newspapers. This is before the internet. And we'll we'll just call him Joe. I don't want to repeat his name. Uh, Well, while that was going on, the greatest televangelist at the time, the one who had the most impact, the most uh, viewers, the most money, he got on national television and excoriated Joe on live TV. He said he was a cancer to the body of Christ who needed to be excised. That's a that's a direct quote. I remember reading a book by Watchman Nee where he said he has never seen a case where a person who looked down their noses at another uh, at another Christian in self-righteous judgment who didn't fall into the same thing or worse later on. And that guy who got on national television, the greatest televangelist of the time, and perhaps even in history, when he excoriated Joe for Joe's fall, it was not long <laughs> until we found out that this televangelist was doing the same things. And he crashed and burned, and he's never recovered, yeah. even to this day. So that's the boomerang effect. My point is, I'm not going to comment on any of those <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> because all of us are open game for any mistake. 
no matter how small or big. And the second one is the house top uh, expose. The house top expose, that's a reference to the Lord's words about certain things being proclaimed from the housetops, right? That that happened in secret. Um, this comes from Ray Stedman, who is an author who wrote some really fine books. But he was once asked, you know, how do you keep yourself from uh, yielding to temptation? And he said, he was an older man at the time, he said, well, I wish I could tell you that because I have this gray head, uh, you know, temptations don't come my way, or I'm so strong in the Holy Spirit that I just, you know, blow smoke and it's gone. He said, that's not the truth. He said, the thing that keeps me from yielding to temptation is the fact that it's going to be all over the news. <laughs> and I don't want to be shamed. It's the housetop expose. And I thought that was beautiful. You know, some people may say, well, that's not spiritual. Well, guess what? If that's going to keep that brother, and it did, from, you know, making a boneheaded mistake that's going to destroy his life, I don't have a problem with that. Hmm. Uh, and then the danger of the empty room uh, or the empty house, which I mentioned before, you're the most vulnerable to temptation after God has used you in power. Most every person who you've mentioned or other people, you know, throughout the pages of history, you know, who have made mistakes that have destroyed them. Um, every one of them was successful. You know, in the eyes of the world, successful. I don't know about in, in the eyes of the kingdom. Only God knows that. But those are the only three things I would remark on it. I would not say anything else beyond that. The boomerang effect, the housetop expose, and the danger of the empty house. That was good. Thanks, Frank. Um, so we'll wrap it up with a few more questions here with you as we're coming to a close. So uh, personally, which law has been particularly challenging maybe for you to follow in your own life? Law number eight discouragement overcome discouragement uh that's a big one i think naturally my wiring um you know when i came out of the womb <laughs> i was predisposed and and still am predisposed to see the glass as being half empty or uh having a problem with the liquid in the glass and feeling it's not clear enough um and so I tend to look at the negatives. That's my default rather than the positives. And what I've learned about discouragement, um, a couple of things. One, it's in the uh, bloodstream of, of ministry. You know, if you're ministering in any capacity you're serving the lord in any capacity discouragement is going to come right along with it you can't get away from it it's there period uh even if god is using you in tremendous ways you know you're going to be discouraged paul tarsus was discouraged he he went beyond discouragement he despaired of life in ephesus uh you know eventually he bounced back but that's that's one of the things i learned about it the other thing i learned about it is You'll never get rid of it, but you can overcome it in the moment. Hence, the law is overcome discouragement, but it's going to come right back. So you got you have to keep overcoming it. Yeah. What you have to learn to do is dance with it. And so recognizing that discouragement is your partner, it's going to come and go, but you can dance with it. And if you can dance with it in the moments, where it comes and tries to inflict you and tries to actually press you into something more severe like depression or despair, you can actually dip your partner <laughs> discouragement and be on top of it. Hmm. And, and I give a prescription of, of how I do that in my own personal life in the book on that chapter. Good. That's good. Um, now, Matt and I have both read this. I imagine we're not the first people that have read it. There's probably a few more, even though I think it is uh, relatively just released. What What's some of the other feedback from early readers that you've received? Well, readers have been very kind. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if they're 
just trying to be good natured and pleasant or if they really were impacted i i think they were i think it's the latter uh one person said i haven't highlighted so many passages passages in a book in years so that was really encouraging for an author <laughs> i'll echo people that are, people ryan, are highlighting your book yeah. Yeah, Ryan has my copy of it. I pass it over to him and it's full of highlights. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Uh one of one other person said, I wish I would have had this practical guide when I was much younger. I could have avoided much pain and heartbreak in ministry and life. Uh someone else said about half or more of what's in this book was never taught to me in seminary. And uh, and other people have said very kind words. The reviews thus far have been really, really encouraging. Um, it looks like people are resonating with it, being helped by it. I mean, you gentlemen were, were super kind in your remarks. And I just, excuse me, I, I think one of the other things that has come out is people appreciate the humor. Uh, there's a lot of humor peppered in it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they appreciate the stories and they appreciate the practical handles because I'm just I, I'm not just trying to give information. I'm trying to create formation. And the way you form people is you give them practical assignments. You give them something practical that they can handle and 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 apply, you know, without that, then it's just a lot of ideas. So that's basically what I tried to do. And, and yeah, the, those are some of the early comments I've gotten. Yeah, that's great. Um, throughout the insurgents experience that I was part of with you, I know you've gone over a few of these chapters and done some of the exercises even with uh, myself and the other brothers in that. And I found them extremely impactful, especially the the handles that you gave at some of the ends of those chapters you went over with, with us. So I agree. Um, all those comments you said, things that I've popped in my mind also as I was I was reading it also. So, um, Frank, where can readers learn some more about uh, this book? And do you have any other resources available to go along with it? Well, they can go to 48laws.com. Uh, I don't know why the, the guy who wrote 48 Laws uh, before I did, the natural fleshly one. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't buy that uh, <laughs> domain name. Uh <laughs> So I have 48laws.com and people can go to that and they could uh, test drive the book. There's samplers on there. There's the interview excerpts where I cover, you know, different aspects of, of, of the content of the book. Um, and in the book itself, and we're not going to give the uh, link to it to the listeners, but if you read the book uh, at the very end, there is a bunch of extra chapters called codas that I could yeah. not, you know, it, 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 they didn't really fit the 48 laws. So they really weren't principles, but they were related to the topic of God's power. And so you have that. And then there's a website they can go to that even has more extra chapters that we just couldn't fit into the book uh, that are all related to ministry and leadership and so forth. Um some uncommon things too I address, like, you know, you hear a lot about people stealing sermons. Well, what's the difference between stealing, borrowing, and being influenced by? And so I break that down in that in that chapter, that extra chapter on the website. Um, and then there's a bunch of audios of me speaking to leaders in different contexts, conferences, leadership conferences, seminars, pastors you know, meetings and things like that. So I just felt like, you know, there was just too much to leave out of the book due to space. So I just have people go to a website and they can get all of it. It's all free. So they can get it with the book. But if they go to 48laws.com, they can listen to samples. They can read samples. We have a test drive, taste test, we call it sampler. They can get a feel for the book. The other thing that you mentioned uh, Matt, is the insurgents experience. And that's a high level mentoring mastermind for people who are in ministry, whether they're pastors, teachers, missionaries, church planners, whatever capacity uh, you know of ministry they're in. And you were part of it this year, as you said, if people are interested in applying, they can go to ministrymind.org, not mastermind, but ministrymind, all one word, 
org, And that will take them to the page that tells them all about the insurgents experience and how to apply. And, and I, right now, we do have some openings uh, for people who may want to get into the 2023. Jump on it. Uh, insurgents experience <laughs> or IXP, like the cool kids yep. say. Yep. Uh, <laughs> they can go there and, and learn about it. Uh, there's, uh, there's just, there's testimonials. I mean, you have one of your testimonials there, Yep. but I paid good money for, That's and right. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we, we, um, we would love to have you get on board, but you'd have to apply really soon because the door is going to close and uh, we'll do it. It's all year. And it's, it's a great experience. I mean, I, I, I loved it. And me too. Oh, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's so good. It really was. Cool. Great. Well, Frank, thank you so much. We absolutely love your heart, your passion, your enthusiasm for the church and for, for all things, Jesus. We, uh, we've been influenced by your works and we know many people that, uh, that have been as well. And we hope that all of our watchers listeners all of the above not only uh enjoy and get a lot out of this interview with you today but also go and seek out all of your writings your blogging everything frank so to speak become a part of ixp whatever it is so that uh, we can all together influence the uh church community in the world for a better place so thank you again for coming on Expedition 44 today. And I want to also uh, thank you to our watchers and listeners for faithfully and continually tuning in. May the Lord bless you and keep you.